Hey everyone, welcome to the Man Talk Podcast. This is episode 33, and today we're going to talk about lessons from death. So, Jacob, what was the main inspiration for this podcast specifically? Like, why why did we first want to talk about it? Uh, We wanted another serious topic that we could put together some life lessons from uh, what happened with this uh, series of subjects. So, this next one was... Well, we've seen a fair amount of tragedy. Um, maybe we can get some of our lesser tragedies together and we can make some kind of uh, lessons from it. So before we see any more people die or uh, get injured, we can get a right mental thinking about it and we can prepare ourselves for what's coming up because everyone in this life's getting out of it. So at some point we're gonna see other people die too. So it'd be good to get our minds straight before it happens instead of during. Yeah, definitely. Whenever there's a passing, especially of close friends or family, uh, at least my perspective of it as of late is to view it through like a teachable moment lens. There's uh, ample opportunity to grieve and to otherwise uh, remember the passing of the person or your favorite pet. But it's also a good time to self-reflect and the course correct if there's things in your life that might be going down a kind of a slippery slope or like a tragic route. So I always see it as a remembrance and also in a sense a, a wake-up call. But uh, yeah, for, for you, Jacob, what's one of the main instances in your life that stuck out and why did it stick out for you of someone's passing? Oh, that's an easy one. So my grandfather Dutch, um, so that's my grandfather on my mom's side of the family. Um, he was in his 80s and he was driving and he got hit pretty good. He didn't survive and uh, we didn't even get a chance to see him. So it just kind of came all of a sudden, which is kind of the idea of, again, why we're doing this is uh, death can come all of a sudden and then you're not ready for it and all the things you want to say to that person you can't because they're dead so for Dutch I mean I just wanted more time with the guy and I'm not even really grown up yet Um, I'm about 17 years old I still wanted to have some time with the guy to get some of his lessons and who he was and I only got maybe half of what I wanted from the guy and heck I would have loved to have him around till he was 120 but um, that's not what happened and all those opportunities you thought you could have had were taken away so all those expectations of, of who my grandfather is and was uh, it just went away and then now there's no way to get it because he's gone how were you able to cope with that loss so in order to cope with it um, I actually didn't go to his funeral I was pretty upset um, I actually said it would be easier in some ways to not go and just focus on school and continue with my responsibilities and honor him at church the next Sunday. So I did and I bawled my eyes out at the altar, which is kind of an interesting story in its own, um, and then walked out and had some catharsis, but it took a while, it took a while. That, and my grandfather was a stand-up kind of guy. Um, not too many male role models in the family, um, he's definitely the one that I had that was the best, and uh, I miss him. I miss having him around, uh, and he just had such a positive impact on me as a kid, and he helped raise you know my mom and her sister and her and uh, her brother. So he was just a stand-up kind of guy. Um, Was there a specific thing that you always remember that he told you that was pretty helpful advice? Oh, so in that case, we had had some athletics in high school, and he saw that I wanted to do football, and he said, Jake, if you're going to do football, that's fine, and I I do really like that you're doing it, but I also understand you're doing it more just to kind of get it on your resume and uh, show that you're a tough guy, and he said, you don't have to be that. If if you want to go to cross country, you want to do something else that's athletic, I'm all for it so that way you don't get hurt. And he was right because when I, uh, or my mother rather, messaged him about my arm because actually I was having electrical shocks in my arm um, from playing football because of all the uh, 
interactions and repetitive hitting. repetitive hitting. Yeah, so that that actually kind of surprised him. And he goes, "Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! If you're having that, don't do it." Some people are meant to do it; others aren't. And he said, "If you're having that kind of problems right now, don't be feeling like you're going to be a wuss and uh, get out of the season." That's actually pretty decent advice, considering what we now know about concussions in football. Oh, for sure. I mean, like all of the small concussive effects in the brain causes brain damage. Yep. So that was pretty wise advice from him. He used to be a PE teacher, so he understood a little more about um, the effects of long-term athleticism. So I think he had some wisdom from that already. Right. Um, which was really good because you could argue if I kept doing it, I may not be the same person I am today. And I'm really glad he said that. And he wrote in a letter. It was this wonderful letter. Like he, he took the time to handwrite it, cursive, signed it, sent it over. And it was just one of those like, whoa, I'm probably about 15 years old. And I'm reading it going, this, is, this took a lot of effort. There's a lot of thought in it. And even for a 15-year-old brain, you just kind of get that impact from the older, wiser figure in the family really looking out for you. So that was cool. That was really cool. He told me a couple stories about um, how he's the MP in World War II and some of the things he did as a PE coach. But for what it's worth, a lot of his life I'll never get to unlock. Um, so I have to ask through other parts of the family and then they're gonna have different perspectives. For example, uh, my own mom, uh, she did not have a really high regard for Dutch until I was born. Because then he started, she started seeing rather um, the more benevolent side of him. She was most usually seeing him as a disciplinarian, mm. which is not the same thing. So when he found out that he could be a benevolent grandfather, he she kind of wised up a little bit, and their relationship changed a lot. So th so that was like good. starting the next generation kind of mended the the opinions of the old generation just because there's a contextual change a lot went right when he became a grandfather and a lot went right as far as passing down the information so um yeah as far as the grieving process for dutch um it was really just working through it day by day and it wasn't as uh deep as i thought it would be in terms of oh i thought i'll never get over this because there's some uh, people that say I'll never get over this um, at, after a while I could stand up and say you know what that's that wasn't the end of the world I miss him but man I'm glad that you uh, appreciate that he was even around to begin with so then you just celebrate for what you did have and carry on with that and um, I think that's what he would want I don't think a lot of people that that would have died uh, let's say later and you know they're planning their funeral and they actually had a chance to do all these things I don't think they'd want people to be broken forever I think in loving memory of them yeah. we should carry forward and take their lessons and incorporate them into our own and be strong and brave just like they were so what about you Julian I want to hear about some of your experiences with, with death in your friends and family circle yeah so in my family circle there's actually been a handful of deaths specifically back in high school there's another car accident uh, so this particular girl was a year younger than me and had been with a few friends of friends that I've known and they were out jeeping up in the Mendocino National Forest and for whatever reason uh, the accident happened and uh, the jeep uh, crushed them crushed her because of just the nature of the jeep flipping over and not wearing seatbelts oh. at the time oh. yeah so the the other two people in the vehicle uh survived but the girl in question did not and i remember the day distinctly it was july 29th uh not the year but the day it was july 29th um probably about 20 2009 yep and I was driving with my friend and he gets a call uh, and I don't know what's going on so I'm just driving we're going to the fairgrounds of all places to go hang out at the fair yeah and he gets this call from the girl's mother and the girl's mother is just telling all of her friends what happened it's like hey uh, so 
she just passed away. And this this is the details, and we don't have a, a wake or funeral plan, but we just thought you being like a close friend, we'll let you know. And then I asked him, oh, what was, what was that about? And he was pretty like shell-shocked, like hit by, uh, the news was almost like being hit by a se semi kind of thing. It just kind of stopped, stopped him. Stopped him right in his place. And I was still processing the situation. Uh, didn't really know how to respond because I wasn't the closest friend to her, but I knew of her and we've interacted. But definitely the, my friend who I was with was a lot closer and was a lot more crestfallen naturally because of her passing. So we get the news and then we're just trying to figure out like, okay, well, be kind of disrespectful to go to the fairgrounds knowing this information. But my friend was like, no, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the fair and we're gonna have fun in her memory, right? Because this is what she would have liked to, to have happened. And normally I'm not the kind of guy who goes on fair rides because I have my own uh, prejudices against the safety of those. Um, but in the moment it made sense to like, okay, well, this is something she would have liked. Let's honor her memory by doing something uh, in her memory. So that, uh, that evening we just went on a bunch of uh, fairground rides and tried to enjoy our life that we we knew and tried to enjoy each other's company and just having holding her in the back of our minds as we we're enjoying the the fun of the moment and it kind of feels like an idyllic uh high school approach to like death and it's like oh we gotta you know honor their spirit honor their memory but in the moment it felt very um cathartic um just because, you know, we're, we have them in their, our mind and we're doing something they would like, right? Um, and the takeaway I had with that experience was that uh, although, you know, she's left and it's not with us anymore, we can still hold on to the memory of her and the actions of what she would enjoy. And then with her story as well, there's a second component. Um, eventually, all of us went to her wake. Uh, so they had an open, op not a viewing of her, but it was like a gathering of all the people who knew, knew her. The principal came out actually from her school to pay her respects. And I'll never forget uh, her boyfriend of many years um, breaking down at the wake because her parents apparently found uh, uh, envelope of unopened letters that were directed to him and they just gave him the letters at the wake he wasn't aware of it and he like yeah. saw the situation and just like broke down uh, and I almost broke down seeing him break down because we were very close to each other um, her boyfriend uh, and I were pretty close friends and I could feel the vicarious um, hopelessness through him, you know, it was like, man, this is really tough, having like letters you didn't know exist addressed to you that no one's read from your your ex-girlfriend, that's, I can only imagine what he went through at the time, but it gave me pause and made me self-reflect on like what you leave behind for your significant others or for your family like made me think like okay well at the very least when I'm older maybe have like some kind of will that lays things out and makes things planned out but even even uh, beyond the will which is kind of like a basic thing have like you know things that can still communicate to them in their passing right kind of like those letters but that wasn't, in, you know, intentional. That was just right. after effect. But just having something that they can read or listen to um, when you pass, like, oh, uh, like for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this probably when I'm a little bit older. But leave like little audio diaries 
of my experiences for the next generation if they want to listen to it and just have that little uh you know handoff so to speak of wisdom or knowledge that i gleaned from my life that could help out the next generation at least pass it down yeah yeah so the, the, these are all things I was thinking about when I was like 16 or 17 at uh, this girl's wake and her passing. It was like, oh, how am I going to alleviate the, I guess, suffering that uh, my friends are going through or uh, I might induce on others if I were to see my unfortunate demise. So gave me a lot to, to think about and pause at the time. Well, you said all that. I'm, this is the first time I've actually ever really got that out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, like the boyfriend story at the wake, he ends up being like this conduit of suffering. Yep. So it's not even like, you, you just can't help, but he's just, it's going all over the place. Because there's just so much suffering he's putting on himself from those letters. It's just, yeah. it's going everywhere. So that's probably why you and probably the whole crowd is just feeling the whole thing yeah, yeah. it's and, crazy and trying to console him so he doesn't like just lose it which he understandably uh you know would because that's intense yeah yeah and at the added fact of no one knows what's in the because they're addressed to him so no one knows what it says except him when he eventually reads it yeah pretty private yeah so for you was there another instance of death that had a pretty significant impact on you yeah um so again in high school we had we had a friend jesse and his dad passed away in 2007 and it just kind of came out of the blue too again death can come at any time i think people make a big mistake in thinking that it's just going to show up at when you're 89 and everything's written out everything's ready to go ripe old age is not the typical human life it's not and uh in the case of jesse's dad that's exactly right and that's exactly what happened so the guy gets sick he has to go to the hospital the hospital doesn't treat him properly and he dies so he dies as a medical mistake oh, no. so you know it's different when you hear the statistics of so many people die from uh, mistakes every year, like 100,000 deaths every year just from medical errors. It's different when it's your own dad. So when Jesse's, and he's this big, you know, strong high school kind of guy, plays tuba, like he's fit. The guy could do farm work, he could do trades labor, he was just trained for, and then it, he's still doing it right now as far as I know. But the guy lost his father figure pretty much right when he needed him most which is that last bit of a sprint to kind of get him through high school because he was a junior at that time yeah um or senior rather he just got the senior year and his dad passed away from it and i remember our friends like ben uh, darren roan who was on podcast 29 uh he he and i went and we we're all just trying to like make sense of it all and just kind of give him a give him a hand because if he doesn't have a father figure, by God, he should have his friends around. So we gave him some some good, just, we were just there. And I think that's another lesson that um, I want to mention for uh, when Jesse's dad died. I mean, there there's some things you just can't fix. So you just need to, like, just stand. Just stand with them. And it may not be okay, but just know that they've got somebody else there standing with them. And that might be all you can do. Sometimes advice isn't really the proper place um when someone's dead at that point you just need to stand with them just be an additional body of comfort yeah if they want you to speak they'll let you know <laughs> but if if not then just just stand and, and help them out um as needed i think actions at this point need to be taken into place before you actually you can't even really say the right thing so maybe you can do the right actions um, that's probably your better way of being able to help them cope and uh, offer offer help, um, but definitely follow through. I mean, like the worst thing you can do is offer help and not give it. So you got a lot of people like that in a funeral setting. They're like, oh, I hope you feel better. And then they just, okay, that's all they said. And 
Jesse actually had a fair amount of people who went. He had, he got a lot of people that that went to his fun his dad's funeral, and um, that was really cool because um, he he knows he's got the support. And yeah, there's gonna be some stragglers, but at the end of the day, he had a lot of support. He had a yeah. lot of support to keep going. Um, so yeah, but that that happens so darn fast, and uh, it really grinds my gears when people think that they're just gonna keep going. It's like ah, the, the, the typical human being does not get to live that long all the time as an expected value. So that encourages me. So as you were saying about with uh, some of the friends that have died in. in in your life to make sure that you do say what you mean and you acted in a way that is already like important and significant to them versus waiting. Oh, I'll do that next year. No, do it now, do it now. And then you'll have a long consistent memory that's true and relevant to them, whether you pass away first or they do. Um, or even lose contact, and then they pass away 50 years later. It doesn't matter. You still got the appropriate and significant memory. So, any thoughts on that, Julian? That I know is a lot, but yeah, definitely. So, it's very important to tell the narrative, tell the story of the person that not only best reflects who they were, but in a sense, if they're significantly close to you, honors their memory. Uh, and even before then, as Jacob's mentioned a couple times, to reach out now and tell them how much you appreciate them, because they may not always be there. Yeah. An instance of this, or another instance of this, with a high school friend again, um, is fairly recent, happened last year. I actually visited him in the hospital. But the, the lead up uh, to him going to the hospital was he'd come down with a mysterious illness. He's only uh, about a year younger than me. A uh, mysterious illness that had like flu-like symptoms. But then the flu-like symptoms started to turn into this strange like organ failure uh, that we later turned out was because of the bacterial infection that he got. Um, potentially from the nearby river that uh, he lived next to. Anywho, so he gets this infection and then he immediately has to go to ICU, so intensive care. And his vitals are basically like freaking out, going up and down. He's not very stable. And uh, one of the weekends I was back in town, I decided to go visit because I Known that he was in the hospital and hopefully we could talk to him, me and my friends. Uh, so we go to his room and it's pretty gloomy. The lights are off. His folks are there in the corner. They look like they've been up the last three, three or four days without any sleep. And then his siblings are waiting in the lobby. Um, and they're rotating out because they can only have so many people in the room at once. Uh, and then we go up to to my friend and I looking at him like I think he'll be fine like he looks fine like right right then and now um and I'm just we're just talking to him and he's not exactly all there in the moment but uh eventually the three of us and him start like cracking jokes because we realize uh he's like conscious so we use that opportunity to like crack jokes and try to you know tease each other make fun of each other and it put a you know a big smile on his face because he's been going through this ordeal the last few weeks uh being in the intensive care unit and now he's you know seeing his buddies and they're cracking jokes and whatnot yeah. and then, like uh we walk over to his mom and dad who are in the corner and they're like uh a wreck but when they saw that they were like happy that their son was having moments of joy during this, uh, you know, otherwise somber moment. And, you know, in the, after the fact I was thinking about it, it was like, yeah, when you're in like, you know, the ICU and things are kind of iffy, uh, the least, at least for me, the last thing you want to do is 
try to reinforce like the tragedy of the situation because i'm sure most people are aware if you're in that situation the obvious response is going to be grief pain and suffering but to try to alleviate it with some lightheartedness and try to you know break the ice so to speak of like the difficulty of the situation is pretty I, I think for me i learned that's pretty important to try to like keep the spirits high and just not focus on the negativity of the the situation we call it graveyard humor yeah. which is basically you you walk into that room and then you look at them and go you don't look so good and you're like all smiling and stuff it's, yeah, shut up, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah good to see you too, buddy. You don't look that good either. You should you know? have seen me yesterday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. That's that kind of stuff. It's because what's your alternative? Your alternative is either wow, you look like legit awful. I am so sorry, and I've I've looked at your numbers. Like what? How does that make anyone better? But if you you have a a little bit of spunk with the right tone, yeah, no, that that helps. A lot of people do it in the military, and you see it on off shift a lot because yeah. it's just. The filter's just off. It's great. Yeah, it's that little bit of humor and, you know, ultimately connection with your buddy that kind of brings you out of that suffering moment and back to your past life, your normal life with your friends. Um, for for uh, my friend, unfortunately, about a month and a half later, he was uh, carted out to Stanford Medical Hospital and they did operations on him and things looked hopeful but one night he just uh you know passed away his vitals were all crazy again and the uh you know the doctors did what they could do to try to save him but ultimately um they didn't so when that happened it was uh i was surprised slash shocked because I'd seen him a month before and it didn't it seemed like he would make it it's not like a thing I was just saying to make him feel better in the moment sure for me uh specifically it felt like oh okay you don't look too bad in the moment I think you'll make it and then to hear that he didn't make it was pretty uh somber and uh I wouldn't say shocking but definitely somber and unexpected too right yeah, unexpected. Like on, on your end. Yeah, unexpected for sure. And what the community did, or all of us, the friends did, was try to piece together a, a memory of him. Because we did films together. We'd had uh, hangouts together. So what my f friends put together was basically, uh, instead of like a vigil, they put, put together uh, the his last film that we made together. Uh, and then we showed it at a theater. Um, so then, as a group, everyone's like watching the film or whatever together, laughing together. And then there's a Q&A at the end discussing uh, the film and the life of Timmy and how, how much we miss him. Right. So it was, a good, uh, it was a good moment for everybody who knew him to come together and you know remember him so it was a good send-off yeah the unique too huh yeah specific to the film community too yeah not not everyone's got the know-how on that so that, that's cool is it, it you're preaching to the right group when it's a bunch of film people right yeah yeah because uh you know every, everyone knew his specific kind of humor and then we could see it on the big screen because you know we're running out the theater for the night uh and then everyone's laughing together as uh as he would want all of his buddies to laugh so it was a good uh, coming together moment and uh an additional good way to like bury the hatchet so to speak in the to lay in the lay in the rest so yeah thanks for sharing yeah that, timmy i mean that that story is you know good in its own just unexpected but at least you guys gave him a way to like honor him and something that everyone would understand yeah and he would have liked that and 
again, it's you probably want the same thing. Like, hey, keep while you're alive, keep making films and stuff, would you? Yeah. Like, don't don't just quit because I get, I'm I'm out of here. Yeah. Just uh, just keep doing what you're doing, and you know, don't let the the temporariness of being sick or dying uh, impede your ability to do what you love doing. So, do you have a, do you have another story? I got one more. Yeah. yeah I, got, I got another one we could tell. We could, we'd probably go for a lot longer than we, we should, but let's, let's at least stick to this one. So this one, um, this is a message to anyone who's working off shift uh, about the dangers of, of working under uh, different conditions than your typical person. So we had a guy uh, named Jesus, and he was working um, at the chemical plant I'm working at now. And it was 2016. He was just getting going. He was getting his life together. You could tell like he's, he's paying off debt if he had any. He's getting uh, his property um, plans thought out. He's saving up money. He's got a six month worth of expenses starting to get formed. And you could tell his life is changing from where it was. So he's really ordering himself to where he should be. And then one day he's like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do overtime. You know, I'm not feeling it today, but I'm gonna get it in because I think it's worth it. So he worked a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And mind you, this isn't his first overtime shift. This is probably one of others that he did throughout the last couple of months. And uh, people were checking out. I'm going, yo, man, like, how you doing? You tired? And he's like, yeah, I'm tired, but I'll, I'll keep going. I'll keep, I'll, I'll be all right. Well, the problem is that after the shift was over, um, he drove and he wanted to go. He wanted to go fishing with some of his friends, and uh, the problem with that is, I mean, after 12 hours of being up at work, plus the time you were already up before that, and the time where everything's pretty low frequency when you're fishing, that's kind of the idea, very peaceful. That put his mind essentially to zero energy left on his drive home, and he got essentially hit on the road, and he died of a car wreck too. So that was pretty sad, um, pretty sad, because the guy, he's younger than us. So oh, yeah. yeah, at the time, I think he was about 22. Mm. So here's a 22 year old who just figured out how to turn his life around, and then it gets cut radically short from essentially a couple of mistakes. One being uh, working the additional overtime, but the second one really is not finding a way to rest up before safely getting in the car again and uh yeah it was just so tragic because i mean he just he just started to get his life going yeah so the big message here is yeah don't un, don't uh overestimate your abilities even if you're working crazy hours and you think you're superman like just just don't do that it's not worth it because all it takes is one mistake on the road and you're screwed you could be screwed for life you may even live through it and you may find yourself paralyzed. There's a lot of different ways to get screwed over by a car wreck. And um, yeah, in his case, I mean, the guy, you know, he had his funeral procession, a lot of people showed up and um, yeah, it was a big one uh, for me to learn from because yeah, it doesn't matter how strong, how young, how bright you can be. If you don't have enough sleep and you're not taking care of yourself and you think you can do it and you can't, you may find yourself in a irreversible position like him. Yeah, you were in a similar situation though, correct? You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, so in 2015, I survived a car wreck of my own. Um, I had suspension failure on my left front wheel, and that caused me to spin. Well, the problem with that is at 70 miles an hour, you can't really control that. Right. You're So I'm trying to counter steer. I get onto the curb of the road, doesn't help because at this point what's happening is I'm in an S so it's starting to bend and it's getting more uh, starting to accelerate as I turn more and more so as I counter steer more and more and more and I can't slow down eventually you get to a point where the S is to the point where it completely goes sideways and at that point the wind was going and catches me like a kite oh, wow. so I essentially go into a spin sideways roll three times and I'd land upside down. Yeah, it can be that and then you could live and you could be fine. Or 
if I ran into somebody, I may have not been fine. The thing is, though, there weren't any cars on that one. So I got pretty fortunate. I didn't hit anything. I didn't hit into like a metal pole or that could have complicated things. So it, it depends. It depends on your situation. But by God, yeah, I learned that lesson even back then, but even more so in 2016. So I'm fully convinced at this point that if you're going to do any driving, you really need to assess your your uh, condition. So, and I'm I'm a big I'm a big uh, guy on that. So I'll I'll tell you to the grave that make sure you check your driving condition first because I've just seen it happen too many times. And from my other list that we probably won't get into today, yeah, a couple more of them are from car wrecks. And sometimes it was their fault, sometimes it's somebody else's fault, but. I've learned that's not an appropriate way to think about it. What's appropriate is you need to find a way to be aware on the surroundings of the road no matter what. I don't care if it's their fault. And if you were a little more aware, maybe you could have done something about it. I think that's the lesson I've taken away from 2016 big time. So unfortunately, it's made driving a lot less fun and more of a chore. Um, yeah. And it used to be less of a chore, but now it's it's it may be more of a chore, but at least... Um, when in the event something happens, I did what I could to try and stop that. And for everyone else that's in my life, I think it's worth it. Yep. So, yeah, uh, good old JC. Um, that um, he's he will be remembered. In fact, he's still remembered. People have him on hard hats, like they put a sticker of, of his initials. Nice. Always good to have that memory. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for my last uh, deaf lessons learned, um, this past, I think it was early April, so it was very recent, like within two weeks of the quarantine starting back in March, uh, there is an undergrad in one of my labs who passed away. Um, we don't have all the details of what happened and it'd probably be inappropriate to uh, speculate but from what I understood there was a lot of uh, well unforeseen circumstances going on at the time that just overcomplicated everything not only do you have the quarantine but effectively there's no sources of income coming in because everything's just shut down and people don't know whether they're going to get paid or whether they're going to get uh, money for school. And the longer that, you know, a shutdown goes into effect, the more unintended consequences start going through. Like uh, a big concern that I heard about on the national news with the quarantine wasn't so much the deaths from COVID-19, but the potential suicides from people being out of work and not being able to pay their debts, which initially I didn't necessarily consider. But when you look at the statistics, the amount of people living paycheck to paycheck is actually quite high. So any perturbation in their schedule can have a profound impact on their ability to function on a day-to-day -day life um, so with that undergrad who passed away he gave me a pause for reflection for that whole work week because it was really caught everybody off guard because um, he was like the nicest person that you could have uh, he would always show up with uh, treats and cookies and um, always just be like cracking jokes and he was he was an older guy I think he was older than me um, so it was probably early 30s. So you want to assume that um, he of all people would just pass away suddenly. Um, so that situation is also particularly hard because my understanding is they haven't been able to properly send them off because they're not allowed to have funerals at the moment because of the, the whole COVID-19 thing. So his uh, celebration to send them off is kind of in limbo too, which is kind of just another unintended consequence of our, our times. But for, for his passing, I, when I was remembering him, 
um, in the moment and then subsequently throughout the last couple months. It gave me a, a sense of pause and reflection just in terms of ensuring that I communicate to people like any particular issues that I might have that might be too overwhelming for me and just have a good uh, sense of you know are there problems outside of my control probably but there's also friends who could potentially help out and not to be too modest or humble if you're really in a tough spot that's what friends are kind of for right this is completely different from the more abusive friends who just take advantage of you because you're you're like a rabbit and they're a fox kind of thing. Extraction. Yeah. yeah. This is more like these are your lifelong friends who you don't ask much of them, but if need be, maybe you can, you know. So I learned that through his example to to try to reach out where possible if there's a spot that's too tough to to overcome and not to like hold it in and take the burden of the world on my own back it's a good lesson pretty good lesson because um you never really know until it happens to you sometimes and then you may find yourself well i don't want to beg or i don't want to even let people know about this maybe it's just letting people know yeah. and start there and maybe you can you have another avenue to be able to deal with it and again a lot of life's things we can't solve everyone's problems but maybe we can give them the space to help them solve their own yeah. and if charity is needed um, sometimes charity comes in many forms time talent treasure S sometimes uh, one of the three makes more sense find a way to be able to connect and help them might be exactly what they need. And that's actually what a lot of people complain about with COVID is that before we had all this access and we could do do things and I'd have access to my social groups and all of a sudden that gets cut off and then they don't want to call because they want to see them in person. Well, I'd say screw that, find a way to be able to give them a call, stay connected. It's going to take more work, but definitely that reaching out. People, I think people, a lot of people take that for granted once a lot of things shut down as far as face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, definitely maintain the ties and reach out. Uh, that's potentially the best advice you could give someone who's going through a tough time. Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand because they've got busy lives and then they, oh, it's just a phase or something because they're thinking of, well, my time's short, so I need to like use it properly and maybe I don't have time for an hour. It, some people think like that. So that's why a lot of folk are disinterested in trying to take people's time because they, ah, they're busy. And I've used this excuse before. Um, but when it really counts, find a way to plan it so that way it's not like this inconvenience. There's, there's other ways to, besides just calling them right that second. Maybe plan it out and find a way to, look, I'm having a hard time, I know you're busy, but it would really appreciate it if we'd schedule a time to do such and such. And then that shows you care enough so that way the person that's busy, that can't deal with all their problems, but can still reach out and be their friend, can still be their friend because you've made the space for it, the time and space for it. So if you're too busy and you've got a lot of work going on and your life controls you a little more, but you still want to help, that would be, be one method. And if you feel like you've got all this time in the world, but you can't get your friends, um, that would be a way to make it convenient for them and show that you care, even though you're the one that needs help. Yep, exactly. So any uh, additional final thoughts? Uh, as far as all the lessons we've talked about from, from people who have passed, um, yeah, respect them, carry on with some of their best parts of who they were and to you and honor their memory and find a way to live for the right reasons. I think everyone needs to figure that out for themselves. Um, I think that is part of what makes a human being is wrestling with that suffering of what life is. And if you can find out what, what that answer is and you can get a strong foundation of what you're trying to live for, 
and you are actually doing it, all the more power to you. you every human needs to figure that out. Um, so don't give up on that and don't just put it off because if you find out that 50 years down the line you've been living a lie, uh, you figure it out 50 years earlier. Just find out and see what your life is actually made of. And to build off of that, definitely reach out to those who are still alive and try to get the best advice from them while they're still capable of giving you advice. Because once they're gone, they're gone. And there's not anything that can really get their knowledge or their wisdom back. And that's just the, the process of life and death. You enjoy their company while they're here in the living, in the flesh. And then you remember their company in their passing when they when they die and although it's uh might be tricky to open up those connections with certain individuals in your family if you're really in need of just bonding at some level some capacity then there's no better day than now to to start that um that process yeah and there's anything julie and i think can learn from this for moving forward is finding ways that as life continues and we slowly make our incremental progress, one of the things I think we're both interested in is making something for our friends and family such that we have our things accounted for. We know what, what our will is, we know what we wanna do with uh, consoling the family, how, how things are to be done. The logistics of funerals suck. Getting that already figured out, um, and maybe even just doing the cremation thing instead, which I, our family's big on because we just like 12 grand versus like 900 bucks. I mean, which one do you want? Um, especially for some someone who doesn't even exist anymore. I mean, as far as on this earth. Yeah, the uh, in terms of the logistics, cremation seems to be the way to go because, you know, like you said, cheaper, but more importantly, just we're running out of space and you can't like bury everybody in cemeteries just in general at least not with the way we're doing it which is only like six feet under or whatever yeah um but yeah um having our our accounts in order is probably one of the biggest things that as we did the podcast pre-planning that yeah we need revisiting that idea was really important to hammer home so before we get into a position where it might be too late we already have our accounts in order and it's not not a big deal and we already said what we needed to say definitely yeah the worst thing i can imagine for myself is being a burden after i die for the people who survived me and the more i can try to minimize that burden the the uh less i guess self-conscious or terrible i'd feel while uh I'll feel in the moment, I guess. Yeah. Well, then they can just focus on the hardest part, and the real hardest part is the grief. You yeah. get, you got to get over the, and it's it's not hard. It's hard to just do the grief part by itself. And if that's all they got to deal with, and at least they took care of everything else, I mean that that to me, you can't eliminate all suffering in life. There's going to be a minimum, but if you can at least cut that down, and they can see that that love will be seen even in your passing. So uh, I'm glad we got to talk about this today, Julian. Yeah, good talk. Thanks for uh, joining us today, everyone. We'll catch you on the next one. Cool. See you guys. See you.